Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Good evening and welcome to this special episode of Left of Black, taped on location here at Lehigh University. Um, we're thankful to be here. Uh, many thanks, first of all, to Professor James Braxton Peterson for the invitation uh, and all of you for joining us here uh, in this special taping with a live studio audience. Uh, our guest today is Professor Natanya Duncan who is an, an assistant professor of history and Africana studies here at Lehigh University. Um, as always, we want to shout out Ninth Wonder and Rhapsody for providing us with our intro music. Uh, that's from Rhapsody's 2013 track, All Black Everything. Uh, how are you doing today, Natanya? I'm fine. How are you, Professor Neal? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining us on Left of Black. Thank you for having me. So your work examines the role of black women in the Garveyite movement. Um, the impact that they've had, the influence that they've had, separate and distinct, obviously, um, from that of, of Marcus Garvey. Um, and, you know, when we think about Garvey's arc in the early 20th century, right, he really emerges as a black populist figure, right? Very much a counter um, to the more elite upper middle class leadership of, say, Du Bois, um, Charles Johnson, and folks like that. Um, when you think about the divide at the moment, I don't necessarily want to call it a divide, right, but this difference between the more traditional modes of black political leadership in 2015 and, and say the Black Lives Matter movement, how do you think Garvey would feel about Black Lives Matter, right? Where, where would he be in terms of thinking about this movement? I think he would be very much so encouraging and he would probably be one of the elders volunteering to be consulted <laughs> on strategy <laughs> and um, target, market targeting and so forth. Um, I think that it, it's a bit unfortunate, um, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that there is this supposed, and, and, and when I talk to people who are involved in Black Lives Matter, they themselves as individuals and as a collective do not articulate as much of a divide as we see the media hmm. and some cultural critics attempting to place on the movement itself. Do you think that's apropos to how we think about Garvey in relation to some of the other black leaders in the 1920s? Oh, definitely, right? definitely. I think that um, there are moments, okay, um, for example, between Du Bois and Garvey. Right, right. right? Um, but very few scholars take the time to realize that Du Bois reverses himself in his, um, uh, one of his uh, collection of essays called Dusk of Dawn. In the last chapter, he actually goes into um, a celebration of Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. and notes that he found that Garvey was a person who was ahead of his time. And for Du Bois to say that, I mean, in 1932, 1940, it's really a big deal considering that there was this um, polarity between the two of them. And, and Du Bois, of course, has to know that Garvey reached an audience that he would never be able to reach. That is correct. And I even think, you know, I, I often talk about Du Bois's many lives, yeah. his many incarnations. Right. And I do think that in the latter stages of his life, um, he actually began to want to tap into that audience. Yeah, and his, his um, yeah. exodus, for lack of a better word, to Ghana had a lot to do with wanting to make that kind of connection and sow those types of seeds. Um, one of the strengths of the Garvey movement, of the UNIA, was not only that it had um, a broad-based global appeal, mm -hmm. that you had people from um, various regions of the planet, of the black world and the world itself who joined the organization, freely participated, paid membership dues and had an allegiance to the organization. But also that wherever they were, wherever they were geographically located, they could sort of remix and handle mm -hmm. 
the philosophy and the, and the organization's aims based on the necessity or the exigencies of where they were. And in Black Lives Matter, I sincerely believe that while the movement itself is a movement, a national movement, when we begin to look at it on the ground, it takes its own character in New York City. It takes its own character in Ferguson. And um, the other thing that's particular, and this is really what the pinnacle um, of my work consists of, is you know, people are calling Black Lives Matter a leaderless movement. And I want to know what Sunid and Umama and Carmen in New York City have to say about this quote unquote leaderless movement. Um, I see women who are not only um, active on the ground, but also active in organizing and structuring and disseminating information, much like the women in the UNIA when Garvey gets deported and Henrietta Vinton Davis comes to the fore and then her mentee, Madam mm -hmm. Mamie Demina, you know, erstwhile um, things, other things are happening, but the main crux of what the organization set out to do was constantly being reverberated and targeted back to the membership so that they wouldn't lose focus. And I see these women constantly coming back, you know, and even in showing up um, at, and disturbing political uh, campaign speeches, or lack thereof. Um, at, at, least some, the, at least the ones where there are no CIA in the right. CIA. Right, yes, <laughs> yeah. they get as far as they can get. I mean, you know, Hillary Clinton had, had, was, was prepared. Um, some people weren't. Um, and so, even in those moments, you have a very um, targeted and deliberate message that's being sent. And, they ref and what I see is these women and other, uh, and men as well, the dream defenders, refusing to be taken off of their message. And so a lot of what we see about the supposed generational divide, and even in the UNIA, um, Lady Henrietta Vinton Davis of Baltimore, Maryland, joins the organization at 56 years old. The average age of a Garveyite at the time was 28, right? <laughs> right? And so here was this well-established middle-class middle class. woman, DC middle-class, and, and in the 1920s, <laughs> that was saying a lot, right? Propertied and everything, and she's rolling with Marcus Garvey on the corner in Harlem. That, that local piece is so critical, right? And, and we can think about that in the context of many organizations. Um, when you think about the emergence of someone like Robert Williams in the late 1950s, early 1960s, that could only have happened on the local NAACP level, that is right? Correct. National would have never no. been open to no. that. And even as we see, I don't want to call it a reemergence of Louis Farrakhan, because you know there's a way in which he's never gone away. Mm -hmm. um, but when you think about what the national leadership is of the Nation of Islam, and you see what's happening more so on a local level, where you have someone like Jasiri X in Pittsburgh, right, who is in conversation with like foundations, yes. <laughs> right, you know, yes. in the kind of traditional kind of foundation activism that we think of, you mm -hmm. know, that we don't necessarily assign to the Nation of Islam, but yet he was a Nation of Islam minister yes. you know within the context of that there's so many more things that can happen on a local on a local level that's not yes. reflected nationally and of course the national media is not interested in what's happening no. on a local level but that raises another question that you that you that you raise around the distinction between leaders and leadership yes right the media is looking for leaders right Right, people that they can put up on a pedestal, mm -hmm. that the they science. can assign a certain level of prestige, mm -hmm. but the movement has leadership, right? Talk mm -hmm. about those distinctions for a moment. Well, on the one hand, you have, um, I, I think, and forgive me for this, but you know, since the assassination of um, Malcolm X and uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, there has been this um, idea of a gap. Yeah. And people and, and are no waiting. To apologize for that. Okay. <laughs> people we're, are we're waiting the for the next deliverer to come, <laughs> right? But you know, um, if we listen to Angela Davis, 
and we watch Angela Davis's life and how mm -hmm. she evolved. And we look at Kathleen Cleaver, you understand that we gotta save ourselves. And so this idea of waiting for someone, a great messiah. right, doesn't really... Who's, who's always male. Right? Who's always male, right. right? And that's really why Black Lives Matter is supposedly leaderless, because they can't put a man on the front page of the New York Times and say, it's him, right? They're looking for a Stokely Carmichael, right? right? And the sisters haven't allowed one out the gate yet, <laughs> right? They're still grooming him. Right? They're still They're grooming him, him right. right, in the back room because, again... And, and, and DeRay don't want to be groomed. No, he don't want to be groomed, and so that's why, you know, it's always... And we're doing this as a coalition, right, right because no, right. no one voice. And, and that's also something that I think, you know, in terms of leadership, right, when you have organizations that are able to come together, just like Jasari's mm -hmm. doing, mm -hmm. and say, okay, we have a common goal, we have a common purpose. We may not agree about certain semantics, and, and you know, as usual, I'm going to go back to my Garvey example, where Mr. Garvey is at the table with the Ku Klux Klan, and everyone's right. losing their mind, what is he doing, why right. is he doing this? They had similar objectives. Right, as Elijah Muhammad did after him. Yes. Right, and so this idea of having leadership and having people who are willing to work collectively and think collectively and hear multiple voices and agreeing to disagree in a moment but then at the same time appear before an audience, appear before the news media and say, this is the agenda. And I'm, and I'm very sure and also aware of some backroom things that happen that, you know, right. we would look at and say, wow, that's disparity. But real leadership, real leadership comes up front and says, okay, this is the agenda. This is what we're going to follow. And we're going to work the semantics. We're going to work the semantics, but we're going to stay on course. Now, the idea of having the, 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 the great messiah, mm -hmm. the central figure, I think one of the best lessons that history has taught us is that investing in anyone, and, and you know, in, in my upbringing, my, my parents used to say, never put anybody up on a statue, on a pedestal, mm -hmm. because when they fall, everybody gonna fall with them. And so this idea of having this central figure that everyone is dependent on, and then when they're gone, we start to talk about, well, it, it, well the heyday, the moment, mm -hmm. things declined after. <laughs> no, you know, when you have le good leadership, it's able to rotate. And, and you also find this in, the, in, in terms of the women of the UNIA and the efficient womanhood framework of activism that I write about, where they ensure that there's mentorship. Yeah. That you have a 32-year-old, a 23-year-old, a 19-year-old, all working with an attorney <laughs> right? <laughs> um, to make sure that they understand the legalities, but then also to make sure that there is someone at, at different stages of it learning this so that there is not this disconnect. And that, that was one of the things that was, I think, brilliant about the UNIA in itself was that it invested in young people and its juvenile division right. Right. Um, and, and its women in such a way that the ideas of the organization, even if there was no um, division address to go to, the idea, the philosophy, the objectives, the pattern, was ingrained in people so much so that the grandchildren of Garveyites end up running the black power movement, right? right? You see them in the civil rights movement. Right. You, you can actually start right. to do these connections. Ma Malcolm's the son of Garvey. Yes, right. yes. You know, and so I think that in that way, you, that you also have leadership in the immediacy, mm -hmm. right? The, the leadership on the local level that's modeling for the people who are around them, for the young people that are around them, so that there is uh, uh, an imprint that they can absorb, pick up on, and move with. And so when we get back to this generational con conversation where we have people calling out the young people in Black Lives Matter to say, oh, we did that already. You know, um, we tried that and it wasn't so successful. Um, one of the things that I, I've really come to respect about uh, Ambassador Andrew Young and his cohort 
was to say, we started this. We waged certain battles. We won a few, we lost a few. We're so glad to see you pick up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the attitude of real leadership, of real elders right. who are willing to say, okay, I may not understand everything y'all saying right now, but I'm gonna go with you. You know, I'm, I'm going to go and make sure, that, you know, nobody gets beat up by the police. And I don't understand what y'all singing on the record, but that's OK. I'm going to go with you. I, 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 don't, you know? I, don't know, I don't know what this tweeting thing I is. I know, right? right? You know, and, I and, feel and, like a tweet because I can't tweet, and, you know? And, and, and this, tw this Kendrick Lamar guy, who, who's this right? Right, right exactly. So, so let me, let's take this to an Afrofuturism moment, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because whenever we hear Afrofuturism, we think about thinking forward, right? But we're in Afrofuture right now for okay. folks, you know, for some slave on the plantation, imagining a future, yeah. right? So for a moment, think about if Garvey has access to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, right? And you know, because so much of what we think about Garvey, the things that have remained vibrant in the archive, right, mm -hmm. are, are the pithy slogans, mm -hmm. up you mighty race, and the visuals, right? So could you imagine Garvey on Instagram? Let me tell you. <laughs> Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, Foursquare <laughs> would be on lockdown 24-7. <laughs> and the message, I mean, going beyond one aim, one God, one destiny, yeah. the message would be, the ship is leaving at this time. <laughs> <laughs> we are moving forward on our um, crop rotation <laughs> in, uh, and because you and I had a five point plan. Hell, Garvey could have crowdfunded. Oh yeah, <laughs> very <Garvey>. easily, <laughs> very easily, you know, and, 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 and so, you know, they would, the, the things that they intended to do, um, not only would they have gotten them done um, in, in, the, in a more immediate sense, but I think, and this is what, you know, this is one of the, when people ask me, well, what is taking so long? Well, all our records are scattered everywhere. Right, and so I'm chasing the Negro world. I'm chasing division it's notes. It's, archive, I mean, it's a, right. it's a diasporic organization with divisions on all seven continents and in the Caribbean. So you're following that. Now, if he had had Twitter or Tumblr, it would have been easier for me. <laughs> and I yeah, also yeah, but it might have been easier for the FBI too. Well, see, but see, this is this is the other part that I think is interesting for how Black Lives Matter has benefited from. Um, American social injustice and what historians have had to offer about infiltration into organizations and pseudo allegiances, mm -hmm. let's just call it that. Um, I think that what they've learned and this example by the march in, in New York City the night they surprised the police department because there was no Twitter until they got there. Right. And so the question became, how did everyone know to right. get here when you weren't posting on Facebook, when you weren't tweeting, when you weren't tumbling, how did everyone know to get there? And when someone asked me that question, I remembered a little rhyme someone told me when I was in primary school and they said, you know, you can telegraph, you can tell a phone, but there's nothing like tell a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and so I give those sisters a lot of credit. Inside, outside, game. Inside, outside, game. Inside, outside, game. Inside, outside, game. Inside, outside, <laughs> definitely. And so, you know, this, this, this idea of, of um, organizing, um, and I think one of, one of the things I encourage students to do, and, and this is one of the, also the beauties of the UNIA, they documented themselves. And so when I, you know, I mean, the whole purpose of the Negro world, there's a section called Division News and Views. And people would write in and say, you know, this week um, the Chicago Division visited the Philadelphia Division and so and so sp spoke, and this was the topic, you know, and then they would sign their name as the reporter. And then there was a section called the People's Forum where people would write in to the editor, and whatever was on their chest, they got it off. And so when I look at Facebook and when I look at, at Twitter, 
I see the archive. Wow. I see the primary source material that five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when someone asks any young person, regardless of their color, what did you do? Well, let me go back to my Facebook page and use the Rewind app so I can tell you, <laughs> right? Because it's there. And so on, 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 on one hand, social media um, has really come to kind of open dialogues, I believe, transnationally mm -hmm. and locally that, and, and across generational lines that for a number of years seem to not have been happening as frequently, you know, um, in, in terms of the larger public. I mean, you still have your uh, various organizations that attempt to cultivate that, but through social media, you have this widespread, and I, lo I look at it the same way I look at the Negro world and the circulation of the Negro world newspaper. Here you have a broadcast message being sent out you know, and people, regardless of where they are, pick up, and they pick up on the parts of the conversation that are relevant to them, what touches them. And so that then, as a historian, also helps, you know, the color of my narrative, you know, and it, it helps young people understand, you know, the multiplicity of their existence, that they're not just here for this moment, for this time, and it's about what's around the corner, they recognize that the world is seeing their corner. And that in itself makes all the difference. So, and, and I'm, I, I admit it's good and it's bad, you know, but at the same time, I think the good outweighs the bad mm -hmm. in that sense because it really truly makes a statement about where not just young black people, but where this country is in this moment. We've been joined this evening by Professor Natanya Duncan, associate, excuse me, assistant professor. Yeah, from your lips to God's <laughs> Assistant professor of history and Africana studies here at Lehigh University. Thank you for joining us, Thank Professor you. Duncan. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> black lights and booze burn when I record for watch, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. Hard black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black.